Hey, Bob. So I have a bunch of patron emails for you and I to read on the air, on the podcast, into our microphones, recording on the computers, and then you and I will answer the questions, talking into the microphones, recording on the computers, and then I'll <laughs> then I'll edit all this stuff, <laughs> compress it, touch it up a bit, post it, name mm-hmm. it something. Uh, Stacy will add. Well, actually, Stacy will post it. She'll add some uh, some uh, art to it. And then the listeners, well, on their RSS device, it'll download automatically to their phone. They will, they will open up their device. They'll click play, and they'll listen somehow on their, on their earbuds or in yeah. their car or on a speaker. And then they will benefit or be bored to tears by either my description or our answers. What do you say, Bob? I say, I'm kind of curious what happens myself. <laughs> this is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. Who are you, Bob? I am a therapist here in practice in Seattle, um, all online these days, and um, your old friend from graduate school. Yeah. And we're in a uh, fantasy football league together now. That's right. I got trounced. Yeah, you did. I got. I think I got beat worse than anybody, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, your, yeah. Your, your team isn't looking good. But, no. <laughs> but you, you should do better this week. You should be okay this week. All right. The thing predicted that I'd win five of 13 games this season. Yeah. Five, five and eight is my record supposed yeah, to be. That's not, that's, not, that's not a good sign. But, you no, know, it's not. not terrible. All right. Patron Kathleen says, upper tier patron Kathleen. She mm-hmm. at, so she always has these really short questions for us, which are great. So first question, interesting question here. How would you feel about sharing your password with your wife? Bob, what do you think? Oh, yeah, sure. She can see anything that I see. No problem. Yeah, me too. (laughs) She does have my passwords. Yeah, exactly. uh, For the most part. And yeah, I have total trust in her to, one, not dig around, and two, if she did, not overreact. And three, trust myself that there's nothing really... Nothing about what I'm doing that is problematic so <laughs> right well I keep my all we have I we have a hundred different accounts that need passwords and I keep them in a spreadsheet because I can't keep them straight and uh, they're in a folder that you know in the event of my death she can access yeah yeah oh did you know that you're my professional will like help me close up my practice in the event of my death I think you're mine too yeah, <laughs> it's been a while since I've visited that. Yeah, yeah, right. So if you every, therapist, if you suddenly die without having the ability to prepare, or yeah. you suddenly become incapacitated, you need to, in a statement, legal uh, statement, somehow designating a professional that has access to your records so that they can contact the clients, maybe even have a, a wrap up session, this kind of thing, and it's. I would venture to say 3% of clinicians have this uh, or and a, and a f- lesser percentage have it and actually have told people where it is. I'm actually only half sure I even have it. And if I have it, I don't know where it is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> is it, mm-hmm. Maybe it's like one of those things you just need to do like every year. There should be mm-hmm. just like every year you just sort of revisit where that is. And also your will as well mm-hmm. and just your your general will is, is mm-hmm. important as well but yeah I, I have that as well um, uh, I, I'm not as um, tech unsavvy to have a spreadsheet that has uh, passwords in it I, know. Uh, I mean is the is the spreadsheet password at, at least passworded and encrypted at least yeah and it's also called something that nobody thinks is a password spreadsheet oh, okay but it you doesn't... need a password to get into that into that all right well, at any rate, um, well, what uh, do other people do? Well, I have a safe deposit box actually that has the passwords printed on a piece they, of paper. They change too much. Well, I have. Well, I visit my safe deposit box. I mean, so I have one password to rule them all, and that oh. changes every once in a while. Ooh. You know my what I mean? Pre- my precious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, next question, upper tier uh, patron, Kathleen. And, you know, there are tech people out there listening right now <laughs> that are just like, you guys Our are fun. doing it. You guys are doing it all along. <laughs> There's there there are password apps you can use, mm, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah so, they're all, you know. And they're right. Yeah. Upper tier patron, Kathleen. How long do you think you will be remembered the 
the day after how many do you th- how long do you think you will be remembered the day after you die the day after you die i think you know so yeah. how long do you think you will be, you will be remembered after you die bob how long do you think i've thought about this um at best let's see i have nieces and nephews who are 30 years younger than me so i would say 30 to 40 years but i will not be a central figure in their lives because we don't see each other that much and um i'd say to the people that i'm close to and meaningful that are meaningful you know my close people like you i'd say 20 years 25 maybe yeah yeah i actually wrote a song about this in my 20s and i I probably made you listen to it because i have a habit of always making people listen to probably liked it my stupid songs, songs but but I have it, and it's something that I think about because I think about death all the time. Yeah, right. and I wrote this song when I was I don't know twenty five or something, and and I'll just sort of uh, the it, the last stanza is, who will be there when I'm dead? Brothers, mm-hmm. sisters, parents, cousin, aunts and uncles, nieces, nephew. I'm sure of the friends there will be few. Mm. What will there be children there to survive me, or will I die all alone? Will a wife be there to wear black? Will the minister even know my name? Mm. So I, I've been thinking about this for a long time, up at your patron, Kathleen, and mm-hmm. I would like to think that I would be remembered, but I don't think I will be. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the listeners might be like you know, upset by that, but you know, even think about someone like that is just ginormously uh, famous or something. Mick well, Jagger. Well, there's so there's well someone that's dead like Prince or something. Oh, okay. There's two different lines of remembrance, right? There's the people close to you, and then there's like your mark on culture or something. My mark on culture is you know point zero 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 one percent that of say Prince. Well, everyone remembers Prince, and people remember him very well. But how long? How many times are people thinking about Prince? It's not very much. You know what I mean? Like, it, it's a lot because he's, you know, hugely famous. Michael Jackson, for example. Mm-hmm. But it's not like people are weeping themselves asleep every night thinking about them. You know, it's a it's a fleeting thought every now and then. You know, it's, it's a lot because they were ginormous, but. So I don't have any aspirations of somehow uh, being remembered for very much longer. Although I will tell you, uh, me and Umberto have an IMDb page now. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, have, <clears throat> I have no idea how that works. Wow. Um, uh, someone must have just deemed it our podcast big enough that they – not only gave an IMDb page to the podcast, but also to me and Umberto. And it, it's just kind of funny to think. Anyway. Wow, I'm, I haven't seen it. I'm going to go see it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's just a tiny little page. And it, according to the IMDb page, we've made five podcast episodes um, oh. instead of 1,000 and you know, 200. But anyway. Wow. Um, in terms of people in my life remembering me, you know, it's a similar kind of thing of like, well, my grandma, I loved her a lot and she died four years ago about and you know i think about her every now and then Mm -hmm. and i remember her Mm -hmm. and you know there are other people in my family that will remember her so you know you would say maybe a hundred years after her death there will be someone in our family that will think about her on some level you know Mm -hmm. but it's not like it's massively remembered you know uh, and I, I just think that death, we just have to accept that it's awful and then life goes on, yeah. <laughs> you know, without my grandma, life went on. When I'm dead, the world will, will go on. And, you know, I, I expect people close to me will, will think about me, uh, especially right after the death, but I would, you know, expect and hope that they would kind of forget about me on a certain level because yeah. you can't live in the past. You got to, you got to move forward in life. Yeah. And so, um, so that's my long answer to that question. Do you, I think that Kathleen is asking, um, somewhere in the subtext, what I hear is, um, something about making life meaningful and purposeful. Yeah. 
And maybe maybe the best I can do is to make the time I have meaningful and purposeful. Because I, I, I'm like you. I don't want people to be thinking about me and crying at my tombstone. If I even have one, I don't think I will. Um, but nobody would anyway. So we've got what we've got. We don't need to anthropomorphize death. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Although but, I, but 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 I do it too Kathleen just so you know. It scares the shit out of me too. Yeah. Yeah. I would like to be a small line in a history of media related clinicians as someone who was at the beginning of the podcast thing. You know, cuz I I literally was the fourth psychology podcast in the English language and potentially around the world that had ever existed in, in 2008. And so, wow. so I'd like to, th and I am, Neat. I, two of those four have died. And so it's just, so the, so there's Dr. Dave, which is um, the shrink is no shrink rap shrink is no, I can't remember shrink rap podcast. I can't remember what's called, but, mm -hmm. and then there's me. And then, and, and we were alone for a long time. Their mm -hmm. psychology podcasts didn't really take off until, I don't know, I'd say five or seven years ago or something. Mm. So I'd like to be remembered, you know, in, a, in, the, in the chapter on like podcasting that I would be like mentioned, but mm -hmm. I'm guessing I won't be. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny when everyone's, because I, you know, look at Reddit and there's a, there's a, I subscribe to a lot of subreddits for podcasting and psychology and all these kinds of subreddits. And occasionally people will ask, you know, what are some good psychology podcasts? And I always, out of curiosity, want to see what people are saying. But I also am like, is anyone going to mention our podcast? And we're almost never mentioned. And I, I, I've just accepted that we have a very niche audience. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Where There are other psychology podcasts like the psychology podcast it's mm. it's actually called the psychology podcast that are much more general and they're much more appealing to a, a wider psychology audience people listening right now are niche people that like our very niche product <laughs> you know mm -hmm. we are this tiny little boutique coffee shop that doesn't have the best signage and it costs a little bit more than Starbucks and it takes longer to get to the point. <laughs> it takes longer to get your coffee. Uh, some of the mugs are a little chipped and I, I'm running around trying to make coffee five times a week and uh -huh. uh, sometimes I'm in a bad mood and you know it's not very slick mm -hmm. and 99% of coffee goers would rather go to the Starbucks across the street. Uh, I don't want to disparage the other podcast. I mean, S Starbucks is great. Uh, uh, you know, Seattle product. I like Starbucks, but yeah. But anyway, um, but you're saying what a brew. Yeah. <laughs> and so I doubt that I'll even be mentioned in, in that history chapter because because of that reason, you know yeah. what I mean. Anyway, um, but you know, it'd be it'd be nice. It, it is part of the meaning of my life, honestly, not to be remembered, but to actually be now alive and yes. provide what I believe to be something that will be much more prevalent a hundred years from now. I think a hundred years from now, or even thirty years from now, there will be dozens and dozens and hundreds of these little niche things. It's sort of like when coffee shops first started to kind of crop up in Seattle, for example. Well, and Starbucks was just one of those coffee shops, right? And, and when you think back to that beginning and when Espresso first kind of landed in Seattle, I remember it was like late 80s was when I first started seeing Espresso machines. And you could kind of trace back to the, the origins of that sort of thing. And now Espresso is everywhere. People have espresso machines in their homes, which is like completely unheard of. Well, so in the future, I'm guessing there will be all sorts of podcasts like ours. You know what I mean? But in the beginning, there weren't that many. And so I, I want to, uh, I see this need and I see 
this market, if you will, yeah. <laughs> a bunch of people who want to find this niche, if you will. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, uh, I do want to fit into culture, I guess, in that way. Am I making mm-hmm. any sense? Yeah, you're making all sense. Okay. Yeah, I like this thing of market. It occurs to me that a market is a place of need. Yeah. That's all anybody goes to the market. They need green pepper. Right. I don't know why. I don't want green. Uh, red pepper is better. But but you're talking about, yeah. You're yeah. Making, you are making sense. Yeah, I guess in that analogy, yeah, there's a there's a market, and there's no peppers. Right. And I'm like, hey, you know, there's a there's a new way to make peppers in this region and I can right. make it. Yeah. And you know, all the other people are like, ah, that's newfangled technology and you know, it it debases the the profession <laughs> to to do that. And I'm like, well, you know, there's a way to do it and and so uh, you know, I'm I was there for 7 years and no one wanted to buy my peppers and then suddenly people yeah. did. Anyway, Next final question. Hey, there's there's this line from a Whitman poem. Yeah. I can't remember the whole thing, but it goes something like, what good amid these, O oh, me, O oh, life? Answer, that you are here, that you exist, that identity exists, and that the powerful play goes on, and you may contribute a verse. Yeah. I mean, do you feel that way? Yeah. I'm having a good week. Yeah. Yeah. How do you contribute? Oh, my couples, my my individuals, my people, uh, that, and my wife um, in um, making uh, um, a good and safe and happy life together. Um, those are the two main ones. And and no, I'm sorry, because I can, I can get a little myopic, I think with COVID in particular, but I've got you. You're, you're like this fabulous friend in my life, you know, and um, I got trounced at fantasy football and that's really cool, <laughs> right? It's fun to get trounced in fantasy football. Anyways, all these things. Yeah, it's these, beautiful. Yeah. And I will just say ditto, Yeah. but with more podcasts sprinkled in there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take a break. We get back. Let's answer more questions, and I will try to be not as long-winded. What do you say? Uh-huh. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> okay, we're back from the break. So next question, upper tier patron, Kathleen asks, do you think your name influences who you become in life? Bob, what do you think? My dad wanted to name me Siegfried. Can you imagine? <laughs> Just tattoo kicked me hard right across my forehead. My sister wanted to name me Gooch. Gooch. <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> um, I do not like my name. Really? Yeah. The name Bob. I don't know. It's so generic white guy. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't. I don't hate it. I just, I don't like it. I don't, I can't think of a better name for me. I kind of Did you ever want to have a different name? No, not, not one I could name. Not one I had in mind. I didn't want to be like Ted or something. Um, When I was a kid, I wanted to be Jason because of Jason Jason and the Argonauts. Oh, right on. Good choice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, My last name, Gettle, means little God. And in my youth, I used to think, oh, that's so cool, man. My name means little God. And now I think... Who on earth has the hubris to name themselves Little God? It's just, it's just, and if you're going to do it, why not go for Big God? I I don't know. <laughs> yeah, Medium God. Yeah, least. Medium Sized God at least, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, does my name influence? I don't know. I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, I guess based on the associations with your name, yeah. the question would be, are you more mundane somehow? Right. Bob, mundane. I mean, did you be if you had a more exotic name like like Siegfried? Well, I saw it's an interesting question. So, if you had a name like Siegfried, and people treated you differently, and you realized my name is weird, you mm-hmm. know, there's really no way to get around it. You, you mm-hmm. went Siggy, mm-hmm. you know. I guess you could go Fred, maybe, but mm-hmm. it would perhaps motivate you to say, okay, 
if this is the cloak I'm wearing, then I'm just, I'm just going to wear it. Right. You know? Exactly. Uh, and maybe you would have been more flashy and more. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's possible. Possible. It is. It's possible. We are such a product of our experience and our interaction with the environment that it is. It's entirely possible. It might be that the name Bob inspires, you know, um, safety, like Bob. You don't hear about serial killers called Bob. <laughs> right? Bob. There's got to be at least one serial killer called Bob. Well, now we're hoping, right? Now I got to look it up. <laughs> serial killer Bob. Bob Hansen. Bob, Bob Hansen? Bob Hansen. No, Robert no, Hansen? No, yeah. Robert Hansen as the butcher baker. He killed English several 20 people. Was it in England? Well, uh, 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 Anchorage, Alaska. Oh. Uh, oh, he really? was in, he was English? No, he was born in Iowa. Iowa. Anyway, so, wow. Okay, yeah, good to know. I, I knew it. There's. I just knew there had to be at least one. There's not one involved. called Kirk. There's no way there's a serial killer called Kirk. Yeah. Did you know there's another Kirk Honda in the world? No. Is yeah, there? Yeah. One. He's younger. Oh. Uh, he's younger. Yeah. <laughs> What's his podcast about? <laughs> yeah. So I actually did a mini deep dive into the research on how names might affect our lives. I was actually mm -hmm. asked. I don't know, almost 10 years ago to come on a radio show and actually talk about this because cool. there was all this talk in the media when Jay-Z and Beyonce called their child, uh, was it uh, Blue or something? Or was it Kanye West named their kid? They named their kid North. Or, yeah, but there's another one in there too. Anyway, the point yeah. is, is that it was in the news and so they yeah. asked, uh, uh, you know, asked me to come on, even though it's not oh. really my area, but I looked up a lot of the research. Anyway, so the research and? does show that names can affect, on average, in a very mm -hmm. slight way, on average, personality, dis decision making, and how people react to that person. That's Those are the categories that I've mm -hmm. kind of figured out from the research that we're thinking about. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, like Bob or Siegfried, would that have affected mm -hmm. your personality, the mm -hmm. way you feel about yourself, the way you mm -hmm. behave? Mm -hmm. Decision making, for example, when everyone in my family buys a car, they tend to buy a Honda. Mm -hmm. Is is that coincidence? Is it implicit egotism, meaning that it's we're just seek you know uh, unconsciously egotistical about our own name, or is it conscious egotism? <laughs> it's it's more conscious for me, but perhaps implicit as well. I mean, I in my family we think that even back when Hondas weren't really revered in the 70s, mm -hmm. we thought of Hondas as good cars. Yeah, right on. And there have been times in my life when I thought, okay, I'm not going to buy a Honda. I, you know, there's so many other cars in the world. Like, let's think about other brands here. And I, I looked at Fords, I looked at Chryslers, I looked at Mercedes, I looked at Toyota, I looked at uh -huh. Lexus, I, you know, and I always just thought, you know, it. Why not? They're, you know, the Honda, you know, you could go to a Toyota, but they're basically the same as the Honda. So why not just get the Honda? Anyway. I um, think the closest you ever got to getting away from Honda was to have an Acura. Yeah, I had an Acura. That is, is a Honda product. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and a great car. It was. Uh, 300,000 miles. And yes. it had a um, leak in something and there was standing water in the passenger seat uh, wheel or a uh, foot footwell foot, foot thing yeah um <laughs> research also shows that the more feminine a girl's name the more likely she is to avoid advanced math and and science classes so think what, about that what's considered a feminine girl name well like jennifer or stacy oh. well i guess stacy yeah i don't know i was going to be a jennifer if i were a girl really yeah yeah that was a very common name around mm. the time that you yeah. and I were born. Right. In fact, the most common the day I was born. Actually, I, mm, I, I did this. Um, I was watching, uh, uh, so patron Junie, if you're listening, I was watching, she has this um, YouTube channel which she does um, scrapbooking and it was her birthday and, and she uh, was inspired by our 13 hour or our 12 hour uh, podcast and she did like an eight hour one anyway. All right. I was I was watching her and joining in on that for a little bit and chatting with her in the comments. And then I, at the same time, was I was working. I like to work on lists. And one of the lists I was working on was a list of all the half Asian famous people. 
or oh. have a little bit of Asian in them, you know? Mm-hmm. Anyway, I was also working on this list of like famous people that were born around the time I was born. Mm-hmm. Because I always think that it's interesting to compare like, okay, of the famous people in the world on TV and movies and, you know, what age am I? You know, because I don't know if you think about this sometimes, but it's like, because we're now at the age where presidential candidates are like younger than us. Younger than us. (laughs) I've noticed. (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, each stage, I remember when I first realized that I was older than rookies in the NBA you know what I mean? Like, like you're, when you're 21 years old, you suddenly realize, oh, there are younger players in the NBA right now. You know, there's there's all these little sort of thresholds, if you will. Well, sometimes I like to I like to do that, and I actually made a list of all the famous people who are um, around my birthday. And the closest person, just born a few days before me, is Sarah Silverman. Oh, right on. Yeah. And around me is Ethan Hawke. Ta- oh. Tanya Harding, mm, right on. <laughs> Jennifer Connelly, mm-hmm. DMX uh, rapper, mm-hmm. and Ted Cruz. Oh, isn't Ted Cruz? I thought Ted Cruz was way older than me. I thought he was older than you. He looks older. Yeah, because what are you? You're in the late forties, right? Uh, I'm forty nine. Yeah. So he's forty nine. I thought he was like fifty, whatever. I, he just see, he just acts like a seventy yeah. five year old or something. <laughs> yeah. Maybe but, that's why. So some other just notable uh, people. We have Aisha Tyler, whom I love. Mm-hmm. Uh, David Benioff from uh, Game of Thrones. Tony Hale, who is great. He's from- Tony Hale from Veep and, yeah. um, and the other one, Arrested, Arrested Development. Development. Yeah. yeah. Kelly Ripa, mm. Matt Damon, and Kirk Cameron. So, Kirk? Another Kirk? Yeah. Wow. Adam, Gold- Adam Goldberg. Oh. He's great. Yeah. Uh-huh, he is. Uh, Jeremy Renner, Mary J. Blige, Kid Rock, um, Michael C. Hall, mm-hmm. Denise Richards, Sean Astin, Peter mm-hmm. Sarsgaard, John Hamm. John Hamm mm-hmm. seems older than me, too. I thought he was older than you. Uh, Johnny Knoxville, Keegan-Michael mm-hmm. Key, who seems mm-hmm. younger than me, mm-hmm. Nathan Fillion, and Ewan McGregor wow. are, are all, like, just kind of similar age to me. A few few days either side, like a few months. A few months either side. Yeah. Um, anyway, why Kirk? Like not yeah. Kurt, not Curtis. Why Kirk? So my parents had four kids, and I was third. And by mm-hmm. the time they got to me, I don't think they thought about it very much. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> when I ask my parents, my mom's like, hmm, I don't know. And then my dad says. Well, there was a boxer named Kirk something in the 40s or 50s that he liked. Hmm. And this boxer is very obscure. Mm-hmm. Um, and because at the time, it was soon after Star Trek. You know? Right. That's what I would have thought. Yeah. Star Trek was on from, what, 60, 66 to 69 or something? Yeah. 65. Something to, yeah. So it would stand to reason that that was at least an influence. And my dad was like, no, I didn't, I didn't watch Star Trek. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So not that. I just feel like back then I get the impression that names weren't quite the way that they are today, which Mm -hmm. actually leads me to my next research point, which is that um, uh, they've done research going back 140 years. And over time, parents have increasingly given their children less common names. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. And this is, what do you think this suggests as a part of our changing culture over the past 150 years? I would guess that we value individuality more. Right. And uniqueness, right? Yeah. Whereas 150 years ago, no one thought of themselves as the next influencer or something. Mm -hmm. Right, right. (laughs) Um, Also, (laughs) research finds that um, people with desirable or attractive names are treated more favorably, mm. which, um, you know, what does that mean? What's a desirable or attractive name? Mm-hmm. You know, Tiffany, I don't know. It's hard to think mm. like Tiffany or Jennifer mm. or Jane or mm-hmm. Gertrude or Mackenzie mm-hmm. or Emma you know, which, which it's hard to, but apparently there are desirable and attractive names Yeah. when you actually rank names and yeah. those who have more attractive names are treated more favorably. So 
you will be treated differently, which obviously is going to affect your personality over time. Sure, right. Also, it's found that unusual names were seen as most unique, but least liked, hmm. and also least likely to be hired. <laughs> Wow. So Bobs are more likely to get hired than Kirks. Huh. On average. On average, yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's the research I have in names. Well, and so so it's if, funny, you hired me. I've never hired you. <laughs> <laughs> Case and point. Mm-hmm. Um so do I think that my name influenced who I became in life? It's possible. Yeah. I mean, the fact that I have Kirk. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was a pain in the butt, yeah. particularly when I was younger. I, everyone called me Kurt yeah. or Keith or mm. Craig or Curtis or, you know, anything mm-hmm. other than Kirk. In fact, one of the very first awards I won in the third grade for writing like a short story, it was just something my teacher gave me mm-hmm. or I don't know, someone. No, I think it was the school. I think I won like a school competition. Right on. And... They got my name wrong, and they called me on the award. It said kink. <laughs> Typo. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, was, it was well, it was handwritten. You know, uh-huh. you know how they do those those sort of calligraphy. Yeah, yeah. Kink Honda, and I still have it, by the way. Oh, oh, wow. Yeah, and so it it it. I think it, there's a lot of things. You know, being half Japanese. Uh-huh. Also, I was really tall as a kid. I was very big. I was a very big boy. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh my God. I was, you know, like a giant compared to my classmates when I was a kid. That may have had an impact on your personality, maybe more than your name. Right. Being, I think being big in a sea of little people. Right. So all yeah. those fact and the only person of color in a sea of white people. Oh right. Yeah. Uh, and having a you know somewhat different name, mm-hmm. I think could have because I've always been a little askew from center you mm-hmm. know since i noticed my personality all right mm-hmm. let's get to a clinical question here bob right on self-disclosure patron molly from dc she says i'm a therapist and i've been trained and practicing psychodynamic psychotherapy along with other approaches i'd love i'd love your thoughts on how you think about and navigate being a therapist where in general we don't disclose about our personal selves, unless it's in service of the client, and having a podcast where much is disclosed. Though I realize that the podcast is not therapy, do you have or have you ever experienced some dissonance around those two realities of being a therapist and a podcaster? I'm starting a podcast myself, and notice I feel slightly uncomfortable at the prospect of sharing aspects of my personal life on the podcast. Mm -hmm. Questions like, is that okay? Or how do you navigate that in session if it arises? What do you think, Bob? Yeah, this has come up a couple of times. It's interesting to me. I I actually have a philosophy about being on this podcast, and that is when we talk about personal stuff, I make some effort to be personally revealing with intention because I wish to normalize um, um, the kinds of difficulties that humans can that humans have. And it has impacted when people hire me, if they've heard me on the podcast. Um, I know it it always makes me a little bit anxious, like how is this gonna impact our working together? Um, What's it like for this? What's the experience this person is having and knowing these personal things about me? You know, if they hear something, you know, three months after we start working together, they hear me talking on the podcast, how will that influence the trajectory of treatment? And at the same time, I think all that's fodder for talking about. Right, so like we just get to talk about it to the degree that it's relevant. Right, yeah, that brings up some good points. And the overall thing I'll say to mm-hmm. patron Molly from DC is that it's very complicated. There's a lot of different things and Bob is bringing up some good points. One is, is that it's not as if it inherently ruins the therapy because you self-disclosed, even in, in a, even if you mistakenly self-disclosed, you know, say on you know, say you're treating a Republican and on the podcast you talk about how Republicans are stupid, that wouldn't be a good idea, and that would not be something that would be advisable. But let's say you make a mistake and yeah. 
your client is hurt by that or you think about that and you wonder, hmm, did my client listen? And then yeah. you just bring it up. So, I, you know, hey, client, just want to let you know that I, w- I did a podcast and I was kind of railing about Republicans and I know you've told me you're a Republican and I don't know, did you hear that? Do you want to talk about that? It's a wonderful opportunity for a very deep and at the very least clarifying relationship, but maybe even you know groundbreaking for mm-hmm. for for the relationship and for the mm-hmm. client. Mm-hmm. Um, so it depends on the style of the therapist. Bob is the style of therapist who self discloses in therapy anyway, and yeah. so for him to self disclose on the podcast is consistent with that. Mm-hmm. The the things that he says to podcast land are things that he would say to clients. He, you know, he might talk about how he had a hard time with his wife, mm-hmm. you know, as a self-disclosure to a client mm-hmm. to help the client understand themselves and to help them to feel validated and normalized and to provide that model. Mm-hmm. And in the same way, Bob talks about his struggles with his wife on the podcast so that you can benefit from it. So it's synergistic in that way. If a client were to listen to Bob on the podcast talk about his wife, Bob thinks about that before he says anything and he thinks, well, I, you know, if, if a client wants to hear this, this could help them too. Yeah. Normalizes um, all sorts of wonderful things. And that often is the function of self-disclosure is is to normalize, which is a very powerful function of, of therapy. Mm-hmm. Um, but to answer your question from my angle, because I don't self-disclose as much, mm-hmm. is that um, I have never disclosed anything on the podcast that I thought I didn't want a client to hear. Uh, I actually don't have that many clients anymore, so it's mm-hmm. not that huge of an issue. So I, it, it's pretty easy for me to keep tabs on this given how few clients I have these days mm-hmm. uh, because the podcast has really taken over my life in a lot of ways. And so I am... And I'm always thinking about that, and I always have. I've been podcasting for 12 years, and that was uh, something that I thought about throughout the time. And my advice to you, uh, Patron Molly, is uh, what I did from the beginning was I was pretty restrictive in the beginning. I, I didn't self-disclose hardly at all for the first maybe even like eight years, maybe longer, because it was just better safe than sorry back mm-hmm. then. And then as I looked into the ethics, as I sort of – grew into the role as I had fewer clients, as I um, became a little bit more bold, I felt like I could stretch that a little bit. And so in the beginning, I recommend it better safe than sorry. You don't want to jeopardize your treatment of your clients, obviously. Mm -hmm. And so when in doubt, you know, don't disclose. The other thing is, is um, I will occasionally edit out whole portions of episodes because I felt I was too self-disclosing. Oh, I've asked you to edit out stuff from me too. Right. Yeah. So it's not as if it doesn't cross our minds and it's not as if we don't have a threshold because we do. Yes. And there are things that we think, hmm, this could harm a client if I said this, you know, or I didn't explain it well enough or mm-hmm. something along those lines. And so... Um, and the part of this that is important to think about, because a lot of people will say like, well, you know, why self-disclose on a podcast when, you know, if it's only going to potentially harm a client. But when we're doing ethical decision making, it's pros versus cons. Mm-hmm. That's always the calculation. It's never just look at the cons. Um, for example, you can't, uh, you know, some people say, well, you can't have your... Um, you know, personal trainer be a client of yours, right? That's Mm -hmm. unethical. They say that. But it's not inherently unethical. We just have to look at the pros and cons. Let's say you live in a small town where there's no therapists or you're the only therapist that does trauma treatment and you're a personal trainer and and that's the only personal trainer in town. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So you're the only trauma therapist and and your client is the only personal trainer. Mm Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you get supervision consultation around this, you can do it. So there's the pros outweigh the cons Mm because the because to not treat that person means that person gets no trauma treatment. And so better to get some trauma treatment with someone that just happens to be a client of your anyway. Point is, is that it's all about pros and cons. So when you're self-disclosing on the air, 
there's a tremendous amount of pros to doing that, such as your clients listening and you providing essentially free therapy over the airwaves, you know, at least educational and, and normalizing talk in contact with your therapist. Have, have any of your clients said that they listen to the podcast, listen to you on the podcast? You're not on the podcast that often, but that they might listen because they want contact with you in between sessions? No, nobody's ever said that. I have no idea if that happens. Yeah. Uh, well, it's happened with me. Mm. And, you know, so there's that's, a pro there. That's totally nice. That's yeah. a transitional object. Right. I've had clients take objects from my office when I go away on a vacation or whatever because it just helps them feel connected to me. Right. Connecting with you on the podcast, what a lovely thing. Right. Imagine if that thing you sent with a client actually had your voice and yammered for an hour about their mark on history. Um, the, the other thing is is that there's a lot of public benefits. You know, us as therapists, mm -hmm. we're not just here to treat our clients. We're here actually to try to help the world. And it's ethical mm -hmm. to focus. It's, it's potentially unethical not to f at least think about that, mm -hmm. how we can help the world. And so helping the world at the expense of a little bit of a risk to uh, the occasional client is a viable argument for self-disclosing on, on a podcast. Mm -hmm. Now, the last thing I'll say, patron Molly from DC, is that you're talking about doing psychodynamic psychotherapy. So I'm an integrationist, and so I, I do psychodynamic, but I also do humanistic and family therapy. So, you know, I come from a lot of different traditions, and you're saying you want to do essentially one, which has a very you know, you know, certain sections of psychodynamic therapy have a pretty robust dedication to being a blank slate. Mm -hmm. And now, incidentally, Freud uh, was the origin of all these ideas, but Freud self-disclosed almost all the time <laughs> um, to, his, to his patients. And so somehow Freudians lost sight of that and, be, and said, you can never self-disclose. There's a lot of variability in there, but... I think I would have liked Sigmund Freud. I think I would have liked having a beer with him. Yeah. Or, you know, a snifter of Coke, whatever whatever he was partaking in. <laughs> Coke. Yeah. Um, so I would think about, you know, what sort of section of psychodynamic therapy do you want to have? Because there are some benefits to being a blank slate. There are mm -hmm. some benefits to having clients have almost no knowledge of who you are or how mm -hmm. you feel. Mm -hmm. and having that space to just roam free mm -hmm. um, without any sort of personality impediment on the free association for the client. And so I, to the know, degree that that's possible. Exactly. Um, it's never entirely possible, right? Yeah. But, but in the beginning of my career, before I was a podcaster, that, I, I mm -hmm. edged in that direction. You know, uh -huh. I had a lot of clients, you know, and I... Mm -hmm you know, the vast majority of my clients would know almost nothing about me. Right, me too. Um, but now, but clients could know a lot oh. about me oh, <laughs> if, yeah. they, if they chose to listen to the podcast. Anyway, um, last question here, Bob. Mm -hmm. This one's a good one. Patron Kate asks, Hi, Dr. Kirk and Bob. A, and by the way, listeners out there, if you address the question to me and Bob, that will help me to put it in the Word doc that has the questions for me about. Mm -hmm. Hi, Dr. Kirk and Bob. A close friend of mine has borderline and has suffered a lot of abandonment over her life. Lots of people have left her, and also in recent years, several have passed away. Mm -hmm. I feel offer for her and all she has been through, and she often tells me how grateful she is to have me in her life. Mm -hmm. I've, just, I've just been told I have ovarian cancer. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea how to break this to her. Hmm. I know she will feel this as abandonment. And even though she won't outwardly blame me, her past reactions would have me believe she is likely to want to distance herself from me once she knows uh, about the cancer in order to hmm. protect herself. Hmm. I really don't want to lose her as a friend, particularly oh. now that I have cancer. Hmm. Can you offer any advice on how to help her cope with this in the least re-traumatizing way possible bob what do you think well first off i'm very sorry to hear i hope you're okay 
and I hope the treatment goes well and you make it through. Um, I know that people are afraid of cancer and borderline aside, people uh, can be retracting. They pull back from those who are sick. So um, that's the first thought. The second thought I found very touching. I don't want to lose her as a friend. I mean, what a vote. I hope she's listening. You know, like, like, that's how important she is to you. What a thing for her to know and hear. That's how important you are to me. I don't look at you and I see a diagnosis. I look at you and I see my friend and you're important to me and I don't want to lose you. Wow. What a healing message. What a, just a beautiful message. I think that's just terrific. I hope you tell her that. Um, and then the third thing is, um, uh, matter of fact, I found is always best. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, the only thing I'll say in addition to that is you're very Mm self-aware and you're very caring and you're very wise Mm -hmm. and you know the landscape. And so proceed with that in mind, meaning that when you go to her and you're like, so just as Bob said, it's just like, I love you as a friend and I have something to tell you. I have cancer. And in this very difficult time, I need you more than ever. And I'm worried that the stress of me potentially dying or not being available to you because I'm sick is going to trigger something in you. And and I'm terrified that you're going to distance yourself from me during this Mm -hmm. time. Right on. And I understand, you know, if you have that impulse, I would kind of get it, but man, do I need you during this time? Um, you know, That's awesome. Uh, the reason why someone with borderline would uh, distance themselves is because, as, as you're saying, patron Kate, she is worried about abandonment. So if, if you lay it on, on the line of just like, I don't want, I need you. <laughs> and so please don't abandon me. There's so much security in that for someone who worries about abandonment that it would be hard to resist that level of closeness. <laughs> um, so trust that underneath that sensitivity is a you know a very normal human being who very normally wants to have closeness and very normally wants to care for their friend. And so uh, ha- I would have that trust. The, the difference between you and the people in the past, because, you know, patron Kate, you've heard her talk about like, People in the past, you know, of these kinds of things, even people that have died, your friend has felt that abandonment and maybe been angry about that loss and and you're worried about that. Well, the difference was, I'm guessing, your friends, other people did not have the conceptualization and the wisdom and the care that you do. And it led to a vicious cycle where it, it the distance, you know, like, imagine, patron Kate, that if you had no idea, you had no conceptualization of what was going on with your friend, and you just go to your friend and you're just like, I have, I have ovarian cancer, I don't know what to do. And then your friend, you know, over the next couple of months, just, uh, just stops texting you back a little bit, you know, just a little bit of distance. And then you're hurt by that. And you're mm-hmm. like, now of all times Mm -hmm. and then you just stop texting her and then we're off to the races Mm -hmm. you know what i mean Mm -hmm. whereas for you patron kate you know if there is a little bit of distance you know you're not gonna misinterpret that as malicious neglect you're gonna go oh you know it's probably something going on with that and from that conceptualization emerges compassion and the road forward which is something along the lines of hey I really need you and I trust you and I love you. And if my cancer is causing you a lot of anxiety, uh, I can appreciate that. Let's talk about it, you know, or, you know, something along those lines. Uh, Most people don't do that uh, because most people don't see the world in an accurate way like you do, Patron Kate. All right. Any final words, Bob? That was lovely. Right on. 
uh, thanks. <laughs> I don't know how to take compliments. I didn't, I, my brain just completely, uh, froze up there. It's like, um, okay, what should I say? A joke? Do I, do I, do I downplay myself? <laughs> anyway. All right, everyone, please take care of yourself because you deserve it.